Claudius Part 1 of The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Steely. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson. And edited by T. Forrester. Claudius Part 1, Paragraphs 1 to 15. Livia, having married Augustus when she was pregnant, was within three months afterwards delivered of Drusus, the father of Claudius Caesar, who had at first the premonon of Decimus, but afterwards that of Nero, and it was suspected that he was begotten in adultery by his father-in-law. The following verse, however, was immediately in every one's mouth. Tos uticus cae primina padia. Poetically translated as, Nine months for the common births the fates decree, But for the great reduce the term to three. This Drusus, during the time of his quiesta and praetor, Commanded in Rattan and German wars, And was the first of all Roman generals who navigated the northern ocean. He made likewise some prodigious trenches beyond the Rhine, which to this day are called by his name. He overthrew the enemy in several battles, and drove them far back into the depths of the desert. Nor did he desist from pursuing them until an apparition, in the form of a barbarian woman of more than human size, appeared to him, and in the Latin tongue forbade him to proceed any further. For these achievements he had the honour of an ovation and the triumphal ornaments. After his praetorship, he immediately entered into the office of consul, and returning again to Germany, died of disease in the summer encampment, which thence obtained the name of the unlucky camp. His corpse was carried to Rome by the principal persons of the several municipalities and colonies upon the road, being met and received by the recorders of each place, and buried in the Campus Martius. In honour of his memory, the army erected a monument, around which the soldiers used annually, upon a certain day, to march in solemn procession, and persons deputed from the several cities of Gaul performed religious rites. The Senate, likewise, among various other honours, decreed for him a triumphal arch of marble with trophies in the Appian Way, and gave the cognomen of Germanicus to him and his prosperity. In him the civil and military virtues were equally displayed, for, besides his victories, he gained from the enemy the spolia opima, and frequently marked out the German chiefs in the midst of their army, and encountered them in single combat, at the utmost hazard of his life. He likewise often declared that he would, some time or other, if possible, restore the ancient government. In this account, I suppose, some have ventured to affirm that Augustus was jealous of him, and recalled him and because he made no haste to comply with the order, took him off by poison. This I mention that I may not be guilty of any omission, more than because I think it's either true or probable, since Augustus loved him so much when living that he always in his wills made him joint heir with his sons, as he once declared in the Senate, and, upon his decease, extolling him in a speech to the people, to the degree that he prayed the guards to make his Caesars like him, and to grant himself as honourable an exit out of this world as they had given him. And, not satisfied with inscribing upon his tomb an epitaph in the verse composed by himself, he wrote likewise the history of his life in prose. He had by the younger Atonia several children, but left behind him only three, namely Germanicus, Livilia, and Claudius. Claudius was born at Lyons in the consulship, of Julius Antonius and Fabius Africanus, upon the 1st of August, at the very day upon which an altar was first dedicated there to Augustus. He was named Tiberius Claudius Drusus, but soon afterwards, upon the adoption of his elder brother into the Julian family, he assumed the cognomen Germanicus. He was left an infant by his father, and during almost the whole of his minority, and for some time after, he attained the age of manhood, was afflicted with a variety of obstinate disorders, insomuch that his mind and body being greatly impaired, he was, even after his arrival at the years of maturity, 
never thought sufficiently qualified for any public or private employment. He was therefore, during a long time, and even after the expiration of his minority, under the direction of a pedagogue, who, he complains in a certain memoir, was a barbarous wretch and formerly superintendent of the mule drivers, who was selected for his governor on the purpose to correct him severely on every trifling occasion. On account of this crazy constitution of body and mind, at the spectacle of gladiators which he gave the people jointly with his brother in honour of his father's memory, he presided, muffled up, in a pallium, a new fashion. When he assumed the manly habit, he was carried in a litter at midnight to the capital, without the usual ceremony. He applied himself, however, from an early age, with great assiduity, to the study of the liberal sciences, and frequently published specimens of his skill in each of them. But never, with all his endeavours, could he attain to any public post in the government, or afford any hope of arriving at distinction thereafter. His mother, Antonia, frequently called him an abortion of a man that has only been begun, but never finished by nature. And when she would upbraid any one with dullness, she said, he was a greater fool than her son, Claudius. His grandmother, Augusta, always treated him with the utmost contempt. Very rarely spoke to him, and when she did admonish him upon any occasion, it was in writing, very briefly and severely, or by messengers. His sister, Livilia, upon hearing that he was about to be created emperor, openly and loudly expressed her indignation that the Roman people should experience a fate so severe and so much below their grandeur. To exhibit the opinion both favourable and otherwise entertained concerning him by Augustus, his great uncle, I have here subjoined some extracts from the letters of that emperor. They begin. I have had some conversation with Tiberius according to your desire, my dear Livia, as to what must be done with your grandson Tiberius at the games of Mars. We are both agreed in this, that once for all we ought to determine what course to take with him. For if he be really sound, and, so to speak, quite right in his intellects, why should we hesitate to promote him by the same steps and degrees we did his brother? But if we find him below par and deficient both in body and mind, we must beware of giving occasion for him and ourselves to be laughed at by the world, which is ready enough to make such things the subject of mirth and derision. For we shall never be easy if we are always to be debating upon every occasion of this kind, without settling in the first instance whether he be really capable of public offices or not. With regard to what you consult me about at present moment, I am not against his superintending the feasts of the priests in the games of Mars, if he will suffer himself to be governed by his kinsman, Silius's son, that he may do nothing to make the people stare and laugh at him. But I do not approve of his witnessing the Circian games from the Pulvinar, he will there be exposed to view in the very front of the theatre. Nor do I like that he should go to the Albion Mount, or be at Rome during the Latin festivals, for if he be capable of attending his brother to the Mount, why is he not made prefect of the city? Thus, my dear Livia, you have my thoughts upon the matter. In my opinion we ought to settle this affair for once and for all, that we may not always be in suspense between hope and fear. You may, if you think proper, give your kinsman, Antonia, this part of my letter to read. In another letter he writes as follows. I shall invite the youth, Tiberius, every day during your absence to supper, that he may not sup alone with his friends, Suppius and Athendonorus. I wish the poor creature was more cautious and attentive in the choice of someone whose manners, air, and gait might be proper for his imitation. Atuki panu tu sporadicus leon. In things of consequence, he sadly fails. Where his mind does not run astray, he discovers a noble disposition. In a third letter, he says, Let me die, my dear Livia, if I am not astonished that the declamation of your grandson Tiberius should please me. For how he who talks so ill should be able to declaim so clearly and properly, I cannot imagine. There is no doubt, but Augustus, after this, came to the resolution upon the subject, 
and accordingly left him invested with no other honour than that of augural priesthood, naming him among the heirs of the third degree who were but distantly allied to his family, for a sixth part of his estate only, with a legacy of no more than eight hundred thousand sesterces. Upon his requesting some office in the state, Tiberius granted him the honorary appendages of the consulship, and when he pressed for a legitimate appointment, the emperor wrote word back that he sent him forty gold pieces for his expenses during the festivals of Saturnalia and Siglaria. Upon this, laying aside all hope of advancement, he resigned himself entirely to an indolent life, living in great privacy, one with his gardens or a villa which he had near the city, another while in Campania, where he passed his time in the lowliest society, by which means, beside his former character of a dull, heavy fellow, he acquired that of drunkard and gamester. Notwithstanding this sort of life, much respect was shown him both in public and in private. The equestrian order twice made a choice of him to intercede on their behalf, once to obtain from the consuls the favour of bearing on their shoulders the corpse of Augustus to Rome, and a second time to congratulate him upon the death of Sejanus. When he entered the theatre, they used to rise and pull off their cloaks. The Senate likewise decreed that he should be added to the number of Augustal College of Priests, who were chosen by lot, and soon afterwards, when his house was burned down, that it should be rebuilt at the public charge, and that he should have the privilege of giving his vote among the men of the consular rank. This decree was, however, repealed, Tiberius insisting to have him excused on account of his imbecility, and promising to make good his loss at his own expense. But at his death he named him in his will among his third heirs for a third part of his estate, leaving him beside a legacy of two millions of sesterces, and expressly recommending him to the armies, the senate, and the people of Rome amongst his other relations. At last Caius, his brother's son, upon his advancement to the empire, endeavouring to gain the affections of the public by all arts of popularity, Claudius also was admitted to the public offices, and held the consulship jointly with his nephew for two months. As he was entering the forum for the first time in the Fasius, an eagle, which was flying that way, alighted upon his right shoulder. A second consulship was allotted to him to commence at the expiration of the fourth year. He sometimes presided at the public spectacles as the representative of Caius, being always on those occasions complimented with the acclamations of the people, wishing him all happiness, sometimes under the title of the emperor's uncle, and sometimes under that of Germanicus's brother. Still, he was subject to many slights. If at any time he came in late to supper, he was obliged to walk around the room some time before he could get a place at the table. When he indulged himself with sleep after eating, which was common practice with him, the company used to throw olive stones and dates at him, and the buffoons who attended would wake him, as if only in jest, with a cane or a whip. Sometimes they would put slippers upon his hands, as he lay snoring, that he might upon awaking rub his face with them. He was not only exposed to contempt, but sometimes likewise to considerable danger. First in his consulship, for having been too remiss in providing and erecting the statues of Cassius's brothers, Nero and Drusus, he was very near being deprived of his office, and afterwards he was continually harassed with informations against him by one or other, sometimes even of his own domestics. When the conspiracy of Lepius and Gluticulus was discovered being sent with some other deputies into Germany to congratulate the emperor upon the occasion, he was in danger of his life, Caius being greatly enraged and loudly complaining that his uncle was sent to him as if he was a boy who wanted a governor. Some even say that he was thrown into a river in his travelling dress. From this period he voted in the Senate, always the last of the members of the consular rank, being called upon after the rest on purpose to disgrace him. A charge of the forgery of the will was also allowed to be prosecuted, though he only signed it as a witness, at last being obliged to pay eight million of sesterces 
on entering upon a new office of the priesthood. He was reduced to such straits in his private affairs, that in order to discharge his bond to the treasury, he was under the necessity of exposing to sale his whole estate by the order of the prefects. Having spent the greater part of his life under these and like circumstances, he came at last to the empire in the fiftieth year of his age, by a very surprising turn of fortune. Being, as well as the rest, prevented from approaching Caius by the conspirators who dispersed the crowd, under the pretext of his desiring to be private, he retired to an apartment called the Hermium, and soon afterwards, terrified by the report of Caius being slain, he crept into the adjoining balcony, where he hid himself behind the hangings of the door. A common soldier, who happened to pass by that way, spying his feet, and desirous to discover who he was, pulled him out. When immediately recognising him, he threw himself in great fright at his feet, and saluted him by the title of emperor. He then conducted him to his fellow soldiers, who were all in a great rage, and irresolute what they should do. They put him into a litter, and as the slaves of the palace had all fled, took their turns in carrying him on their shoulders, and brought him into the camp, sad and trembling. The people who met him lamented his situation, as if the poor innocent was being carried to execution. Being received within the ramparts, he continued all night, with the sentries on guard, recovering somewhat from his fright, but in no great hopes of the succession. For the consuls, with the senate and civil troops, had possessed themselves of the forum and capital, with the determination to assert the public liberty, and he being sent for likewise by a tribune of the people to the senate house to give his advice upon the present juncture of affairs, returned the answer, I am under constraint and cannot possibly come. The day afterwards, the senate being dilatory to their proceedings and worn out by divisions amongst themselves, while the people who surrounded the senate house shouted that they should have one master, naming Claudius. He suffered the soldiers assembled under the arms to swear allegiance to him, promising them fifteen thousand sesterces a man, he being the first of the Caesars who purchased the submission of the soldiers with money. Having thus established himself in power, his first object was to abolish all remembrance of the two preceding days, in which a revolution in the state had been canvassed. Accordingly, he passed an act of perpetual oblivion and pardon for everything said or done during that time, and this he faithfully observed, with the exception only of putting to death a few tribunes and centurions concerned in the conspiracy against Caius, both as an example and because he understood that they had also planned his own death. He now turned his thoughts towards paying respect to the memory of his relations. His most solemn and usual oath was by Augustus. He prevailed upon the Senate to decree divine honours to his grandmother Livia, with the chariot in the Circensian procession drawn by elephants, as had been appointed for Augustus, and public offerings to the shades of his parents. Besides which, he instituted Circensian games for his father, to be celebrated every year upon his birthday, and for his mother a chariot to be drawn through the circus, with the title of Augusta, which had been refused by his grandmother. To the memory of his brother, to which upon all occasions he showed a great regard, he gave a Greek comedy to be exhibited in the public diversions at Naples, and awarded the crown for it, according to the sentence of the judges in that solemnity nor did he omit to make honour and grateful mention to Mark Antony, declaring by proclamation that he the more earnestly insisted upon the observation of his father Drusius's birthday, because it was likewise that of his grandfather Antony. He completed the marble arch near Pompey's theatre, which had formerly been decreed by the Senate in honour of Tiberius, but which had been neglected, and though he cancelled all the acts of Caius, yet he forbade the day of his assassination. Notwithstanding, it was that of his own accession to the empire to be reckoned among the festivals. But with regard to his own aggrandizement, he was sparing and modest, declining the title of emperor, and refusing all excessive honours. 
he celebrated the marriage of his daughter and the birthday of a grandson with great privacy at home. He recalled none of those who had been banished without a decree of the Senate, and requested of them permission for the prefect of the military tribunes and praetorian guards to attend him in the Senate house, and also that they would be pleased to bestow upon his procurators judicial authority in the provinces. He asked of the consuls likewise the privilege of holding fairs upon his private estate. He frequently assisted the magistrates in the trial of causes as one of their assessors, and when they gave public spectacles he would rise up with the rest of the spectators and salute them both by words and gestures. When the tribunes of people came to him while he was on the tribunal, he excused himself because, on account of the crowd, he could not hear them unless they stood. In a short time, by his conduct, he wrought himself so much into the favour and affection of the public, that when upon his going to Ostia, a report was spread in the city that he had been waylaid and slain. The people never ceased cursing the soldiers for traitors, and the senate as parricides, until one or two persons, and presently after several others, were brought by the magistrate upon the rostra, who assured them that he was alive and not far from the city on his way home. Conspiracies, however, were formed against him, not only by individuals separately, but by a faction, and at last his government was disturbed with civil war. A low fellow was found with a poniard about him, near his chamber at midnight. Two men of the equestrian order were discovered waiting for him in the streets, armed with a tuck and a huntsman's dagger. One of them intended to attack him as he came out of the theatre, and the other as he was sacrificing in the temple of Mars. Gallus Asinius and Statilius Corvinus, grandsons of the two orators Pollio and Messala, formed a conspiracy against him in which they engaged many of his free men and slaves. Ferius Camillius Scribonianus, his lieutenant in the Dalmatia, broke into the rebellion, but was reduced in the space of five days. The legions, which he had seduced from their oath of fidelity, relinquishing their purpose upon an alarm occasioned by ill omens, for when orders were given them to march to meet their new emperor, the eagles could not be decorated, nor the standards pulled out of the ground, whether it was by accident or a divine interposition. Besides his former consulship, he held the office afterwards four times, the first two successively, but the following after an interval of four years each, the last for six months, the others for two, and the third upon his being chosen in the room of a consul who died, which had never been done by any of the emperors before him. Whether he was a consul or out of office, he constantly attended the courts for the administration of justice, even upon such days as were solemnly observed as days of rejoicing in his family or by his friends, and sometimes upon the public festivals of ancient institution. Nor did he always adhere strictly to the letter of the laws, but overruled the rigour or lenity of many of their enactments, according to his sentiments of justice and equality. For where persons lost their suits by insisting upon more than appeared to be their due before the judges of private causes, he granted them the indulgence of a second trial. And with regard to such as were convicted of any great delinquency, he even exceeded the punishment appointed by law, and condemned them to be exposed to wild beasts. But in hearing and determining causes, he exhibited a strange inconsistency of temper, being at one time circumspect and sagacious, at another inconsiderate and rash, and sometimes frivolous, and, like one out of his mind. In correcting the role of judges, he struck off the name of one who, concealing the privilege his children gave him to be excused from serving, had answered to his name, as to eager for the office. Another, who was summoned before him in a cause of his own, but alleged that the affair did not properly come under the emperor's cognizance, but that of ordinary judges, he ordered to plead the cause himself immediately before him, and show him, in a case of his own, how equitable a judge he would prove in that of other persons. A woman refusing to acknowledge her own son, and there being no clear proof on either side, he obliged her to confess the truth by ordering her to marry the young man. He was much inclined to determine causes in favour of parties who appeared against those who did not, 
without inquiring whether their absence was occasioned by their own fault, or by real necessity. On proclamation of a man's being convicted of forgery, and that he ought to have his hands cut off, he insisted that an executioner should be immediately sent for, with a Spanish sword and a block. A person being prosecuted for falsely assuming the freedom of Rome, and a frivolous dispute arising between the advocates in the cause, whether he ought to make his appearance in the Rome or the Grecian dress. To show his impartiality, he commanded him to change his clothes several times, according to the character he assumed in the accusation or defence. An anecdote is related of him, and believed to be true, that in a particular cause he delivered his sentence in writing thus, I am in favour of those who have spoken the truth. By this he so much forfeited the good opinion of the world, that he was everywhere and openly despised. A person making an excuse for the non-appearance of a witness whom he had sent for from the provinces, declared it was impossible for him to appear, concealing the reason for some time. At last, after several interrogatories were put to him on the subject, he answered, The man is dead. To which Claudius replied, I think that this is a sufficient excuse. Another thanking him for suffering a person who was prosecuted to make his defence by counsel added, and yet it is no more than what is usual. I have likewise heard old men say that the advocates used to abuse his patience so grossly that they would not only call him back as he was quitting the tribunal, but would seize him by the lap of his coat and sometimes catch him by his heels to make him stay. Some obscure Greek, who was litigant, had an altercation with him, in which he called out, You are an old fool! That such behaviour, however strange, is not incredible, will appear from this anecdote. It is certain that a Roman knight, who was prosecuted by the impotent device of his enemies on the false charge of abominable obscenity with women, observing that the common strumpets were summoned against him, and allowed to give evidence, upbraided Claudius in very harsh and severe terms, with his folly and cruelty, and threw his style and some books which he had in his hands in his face with such violence as to wound him severely in the cheek. End of Claudius Part 1 Recording by Alan Steely, Bristol, UK Claudius Part 2 of The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Steely. He likewise assumed the censorship which had been discontinued since the time that Paulus and Plancus had jointly held it. But this he also administered very unequally, and with a strange variety of humour and conduct. In his review of the knights he passed over, without any mark of disgrace, a profligate young man, only because his father spoke of him in the highest terms. For, said he, his father is his proper censor. Another, who was infamous for debauching youths and for adultery, he only admonished. To indulge his youthful inclinations more sparingly, or at least more cautiously, adding, Why must I know what mistress you keep? When, at the request of his friends, he had taken off a mark of infamy, which he had set upon one knight's name, he said, Let the blot, however, remain. He not only struck out of the list of judges, but likewise deprived of the freedom of Rome, an illustrious man of the highest provincial rank in Greece, only because he was ignorant of Latin language. Nor in this review did he suffer any one to give an account of his conduct by an advocate, but obliged each man to speak for himself in the best way he could. He disgraced many, and some that little expected it, and for a reason entirely new, namely, for going out of Italy without his license. And one likewise, for having in his provenance been the familiar companion of a king, observing that in former times Rabirius Posthumus had been prosecuted for treason, although he only went after Ptolemy to Alexandria, for the purpose of securing payment of a debt. Having tried to brand with disgrace several others, he, to his own greater shame, found them generally innocent, through the negligence of the persons employed to inquire into their characters, 
those whom he charged with living in celibacy, with want of children, or a state, proving themselves to be husbands' parents and in influent circumstances. One of the knights who was charged with stabbing himself laid his bosom bare, to show that there was not the least mark of violence upon his body. The following incidents were remarkable in his censorship. He ordered a car, plated with silver and of a very sumptuous workmanship, which was exposed for sale in the Sigillaria, to be purchased and broken in pieces before his eyes. He published twenty proclamations in one day, in one of which he advised the people, since the vintage was very plentiful, to have their casks well secured at the bung with pitch. And in another he told them that nothing would sooner cure the bite of a viper than the sap of a yew tree. He undertook one expedition, and that was of short duration. The triumphal ornaments decreed him by Senate he considered as beneath the imperial dignity, and was therefore resolved to have the honour of a real triumph. For this purpose he selected Britain, which had never been attempted by anyone since Julius Caesar, and was then chafing with rage, because the Romans would not give up some deserters. Accordingly he set sail from Ostia, but was twice very nearly wrecked by the boisterous wind called Circius upon the coast of Liguria, and near the islands called Stockades. Having marched by land from Marseilles to Gessorium, he thence passed over to Britain, and part of the island submitted to him within a few days after his arrival, without battle or bloodshed. He returned to Rome in less than six months from the time of his departure, and triumphed in the most solemn manner, to witness which he not only gave leave to the governors of provinces to come to Rome, but even to some of the exiles. Among the spoils taken from the enemy, he fixed upon the bedment of his house in the Patium, a naval crown, in token of his having passed, and, as it were, conquered the ocean, and had it suspended near the civic crown, which was there before. Messalina, his wife, followed his chariot in a covered litter, those who had attended the honour of triumphal ornaments in the same war rode behind. The rest followed on foot, wearing the robe with the broad stripes. Crassus Frugi was mounted upon a horse, richly caparisoned in a robe embroidered with palm leaves, because this was the second time of his obtaining that honour. He paid particular attention to the care of the city, and to have it well supplied with provisions. A dreadful fire happened in Ameliana, which lasted some time. He passed two nights in the Dribitorium, and the soldiers and the gladiators not being in sufficient numbers to extinguish it, he caused the magistrates to summon the people out of all the streets in the city to their assistance. Placing bags of money before him, he encouraged them to do their utmost, declaring that he would reward every one on the spot according to their exertions. During a scarcity of provisions occasioned by bad crops for several successive years, he was stopped in the middle of the forum by a mob, who so abused him at the same time pelting him with fragments of bread that he had some difficulty in escaping into the palace by the back door. He therefore used all possible means to bring provisions into the city, even in the winter. He proposed to the merchants a sure profit by indemnifying them against any loss that might befall them by storms at sea, and granted great privileges to those who built ships for that traffic. To a citizen of Rome he gave an exemption from the Papier Popian law, to one who had only the privilege of Latium, the freedom of the city, and to women the rights which by law belong to those who had four children, which enactments are in force to this day. He completed some important public works, which, though not numerous, were very useful. The principal were an aqueduct, which had been begun by Caius, an emissary for the discharge of waters of the Fusian Lake, and the harbour of Ostia although he knew that Augustus had refused to comply with a repeated application from the Marcians for one of these, and that the other had been several times intended by Julius Caesar, but as often abandoned on account of difficulty of its execution. He brought to the city the cool and plentiful springs of the Claudian water, one of which is called Cerulius, and the other Curtius and Albundius, as likewise the river of the new Anio, in a stone canal, and distributed them into many magnificent reservoirs. The canal from the Fusian Lake was undertaken as much for the sake of profit as for the honour of the enterprise, for there were parties who offered to drain it at their own expense, 
on condition of their having a grant of the land laid dry. With great difficulty he completed a canal three miles in length, partly by cutting through and partly by tunnelling a mountain, thirty thousand men being constantly employed in the work for eleven years. He formed the harbour at Ostia by carrying out circular piers on the right and on the left, with a mole protecting in deep water the entrance to the port. To secure the foundation of this mole, he sunk the vessel in which the great obelisk had been brought from Egypt, and built upon piles a very lofty tower, in imitation of the pharaohs at Alexandria, on which lights were burnt to direct mariners in the night. He often distributed largesses of corn and money amongst the people, and entertained them with a great variety of public magnificent spectacles, not only such as were usual and in the accustomed places, but some of new invention and others revived from ancient models, and exhibited in places where nothing of the kind had ever before been attempted. In the games which he presented at the dedication of Pompey's theatre, which had been burnt down, and was rebuilt by him, he presided upon a tribunal, erected for him in the orchestra, having first paid his devotions in the temple above, and then coming down through the centre of the circle, while all the people kept their seats in profound silence. He likewise exhibited the secular games, giving out that Augustus had anticipated the regular period, though he himself says in his history that they had been omitted before the age of Augustus, who had calculated the years with great exactness, and again brought them to their regular period. The crier was therefore ridiculed when he invited people in the usual form to games which no person had ever before seen, nor ever would again, when many were still living, who had already seen them, and some of the performers who had formerly acted in them were now again brought upon the stage. He likewise frequently celebrated the Circean games in the Vatican, sometimes exhibiting a hunt of wild beasts after every five courses. He embellished the Circus Maximus with marble barriers and gilded goals which before were of common stone and wood, and assigned proper places for the senators who were used to sitting promiscuously with the other spectators. Besides the chariot races, he exhibited there the Trojan game, and wild beasts from Africa, which were encountered by a troop of Praetorian knights, with their tribunes, and even the prefect at the head of them, besides Thessalian horse, who drive fierce bulls around the circus, leaping upon their backs when they have exhausted their fury, and drag them by their horns to the ground. He gave exhibitions of gladiators in several places, and of various kinds, one yearly on the anniversary of his accession in the Praetorian camp, but without any hunting or the usual apparatus, another in the sceptre as usual, and in the same place, another out of the common way, and of a few days' continuance only, which he called Sportula, because when he was going to present it, he informed the people by proclamation that he had invented them to a late supper, that he had invited them to a late supper, got up in haste and without ceremony, nor did he lend himself to any kind of public diversion with more freedom and hilarity, insomuch that he would hold out his left hand, and joined by the common people count upon his fingers aloud the gold pieces presented to those who came off conquerors. He would earnestly invite the company to be merry, sometimes calling them his masters, with a mixture of insipid, far-fetched jests. Thus, when the people called for Palumbus, he said, he would give them one when he could catch it. The following was well intended and well timed, having amidst great applause spared a gladiator on the intercession of his four sons. He sent a billet immediately around to the theatre to remind the people how much it behoved them to get children, since they had before them an example of how useful they had been in procuring favour and security for a gladiator. He likewise represented in the Campus Martius the assault and sacking of a town and the surrender of the British kings, presiding in his general's cloak. Immediately before he drew off the waters from the Fusian lake, he exhibited upon it a naval fight, but the combatants on board the fleets cried out, Health attend you, noble emperor! We who are about to peril our lives salute you! And he replying, Health attend you too! And they all refused to fight, as if by that response he had meant to excuse them. Upon this he hesitated for a time whether he should not destroy them all with fire and sword. At last, leaping from his seat and running along the shore of the lake with tottering steps, 
the result of his foul excesses, he partly by fair words and partly by threats persuaded them to engage. This spectacle represented an engagement between the fleets of Sicily and Rhodes, consisting each of twelve ships of war, of three banks of oars. The signal for the encounter was given by the silver triton, raised by machinery from the middle of the lake. With regard to religious ceremonies, the administration of affairs, both civil and military, and the condition of all orders of the people at home and abroad, some practices he corrected, others which had been laid aside he revived, and some regulations he introduced which were entirely new. In appointing new priests for the several colleges, he made no appointments without being sworn. When an earthquake happened in the city, he never failed to summon the people together by the praetor, and appoint holidays for sacred rites. And upon the sight of any ominous bird in the city or capital, he issued an order for the supplication, the words of which, by virtue of his office of high priest, after an exhortation from the rostra, he recited in the presence of the people, who repeated them after him, all workmen and slaves being first ordered to withdraw. The courts of Judicata, whose sittings had been formally divided between the summer and winter months, he ordered for dispatch of business to sit the whole year round. The jurisdiction in matters of trust, which used to be granted annually by a special commission to certain magistrates, and in the city only, he made permanent, and extended the provincial judges likewise. He altered the clause added by Tiberius to the Papia Popian law, which inferred that men of sixty years of age were incapable of begetting children. He ordered that out of the ordinary course of proceeding, orphans might have guardians appointed to them by the consuls, and that those who were banished from any province by the chief magistrate should be debarred from coming into the city or any part of Italy. He inflicted upon certain persons a new sort of banishment, by forbidding them to depart further than three miles from Rome. When any affair of importance came before the Senate, he used to sit between the two consuls upon the seats of the tribunes. He reserved for himself the power of granting license to travel out of Italy, which before had belonged to the Senate. He likewise granted the consular ornaments to his Ducenarian procurators. From those who declined the senatorian dignity, he took away the equestrian. Although he had in the beginning of his reign declared that he would admit no man into the senate who was not the great-grandson of a Roman citizen, yet he gave the broad hem to the son of a freed man on condition that he should be adopted by a Roman knight. Being afraid, however, of incurring censure by such an act, he informed the public that his ancestor, Appius Caius, the censor, had elected the sons of the freemen into the senate, for he was ignorant, it seems, that in the times of Appius, and a long time afterwards, persons manumitted were not called freemen, but only their sons who were freeborn. Instead of the expense which the College of Questors was obliged to incur in paving the highways, he ordered them to give the people an exhibition of gladiators, and relieving them of the provinces of Ostia and Gaul, he reinstated them in charge of the treasury, which, since it had been taken from them, had been managed by praetors, or those who had formerly filled that office. He gave the triumphal ornaments to Silanus, who was betrothed to his daughter, though he was under age, and in other cases he bestowed them on so many, and with so little reserve, that there is extant a letter unanimously addressed to him by all the legions, begging him to grant his consular lieutenants the triumphal ornaments at the time of their appointment to commands, in order to prevent their seeking occasion to engage in unnecessary wars. He decreed to Alanus Plautius the honour of the ovation, going to meet him at his entering the city, and walking with him in the procession to the capital and back, in which he took the left side, giving him the post of honour. He allowed Gabinius Secundus, upon his conquest of Chorsi, a German tribe, to assume the cognomen of Chorsius. His military organisation of the equestrian order was this. After having the command of the cohort, they were promoted to a wing of auxiliary horse, and subsequently received the commission of tribune of a legion. He raised a body of militia who were called supernumeraries, who, though they were a sort of soldier and kept in reserve, yet received pay. He procured an act of the Senate to prohibit all soldiers from attending senators at their houses, in the way of respect and compliment. He confiscated the estates of all freed men who presumed to take upon themselves the equestrian rank. 
such of them as were ungrateful to their patrons, and were complained of by them, he reduced to their former condition of slavery, and declared to their advocates that he would always give judgment against the freedmen, in a suit at law, which the masters might happen to have with them. Some persons, having exposed their sick slaves in a languishing condition on the island of Asculapius, because of the tedious nature of their cure, he declared all who were so exposed perfectly free, never more to return, if they should recover, to their former servitude, and that if any one chose to kill at once rather than expose a slave, he should be liable for murder. He purchased a proclamation forbidding all travellers to pass through towns of Italy, any otherwise than on foot, or in a litter or chair. He quartered a cohort of soldiers at Puteoli, and another at Ostia, to be in readiness against any accidents from fire. He prohibited foreigners from adopting Roman names, especially those which belonged to families. Those who falsely pretended to the freedom of Rome he beheaded on the Esquiline. He gave up to the Senate the provinces of Achaia and Macedonia, which Tiberius had transferred to his own administration. He deprived the Lycians from their liberties as a punishment for their fatal dissensions, but restored to the Rhodians their freedom upon their repenting of their former misdemeanours. He exonerated forever the people of Ilium from the payment of taxes, as being the founders of the Roman race, reciting upon the occasion a letter in Greek from the Senate and people of Rome to King Seleucus, on which they promised him their friendship and alliance, provided that he would grant their kinsmen, Hellensians, immunity from all burdens. He banished from Rome all Jews who were continually making disturbances at the instigation of one Crestus. He allowed the ambassadors of the Germans to sit at the public spectacles in seats assigned to the senators, being induced to grant them favours by their frank and honourable conduct. For, having been seated in rows of benches, which were common to the people, on observing the Parthian and Armenian ambassadors sitting among the senators, they took upon themselves to cross over into the same seats as being, they said, no way inferior to the others, in point either of merit or rank. The religious rites of the Druids, solemnized with such horrid cruelties, which had only been forbidden the citizens of Rome during the reign of Augustus, he utterly abolished among the Gauls. On the other hand, he attempted to transfer the Eleusian mysteries from Attica to Rome. He likewise ordered the temple of Venus, Erisina, in Sicily, which was old and in ruinous condition, to be repaired at the expense of the Roman people. He concluded treaties with foreign princes in the Forum, with the sacrifice of a sow and the form of words used by the heralds in former times. But in these and other things, and indeed the greater part of his administration, he was directed not so much by his own judgment, as by the influence of his wives and freed men, from the most part acting in conformity to what their interests or fancies dictated. He was twice married at the very early age, first to Amelia Lepida, the granddaughter of Augustus, and afterwards to Livia Medulina, who had the cognomen of Camilla, and was descended from the old dictator Camillus. The former he divorced while still a virgin, because her parents had incurred the displeasure of Augustus, and he lost the latter by sickness on the day fixed for their nuptials. He next married Plotia Ergulanilla, whose father had enjoyed the honour of a triumph, and soon afterwards Aelia Paetina, the daughter of a man of consular rank. But he divorced them both, Paetina upon some trifling cause of disgust, and Ergulanina for scandalous lewdness and the suspicion of murder. After them he took in marriage Valeria Messalina, the daughter of Barbatus Messalana, his cousin. But finding that besides her other shameful debaucheries, she had even gone so far as to marrying in his own absence Caius Silas, the settlement of her dower being formally signed in the presence of augurs, he put her to death. Then summoning his praetorians to his presence, he made them this declaration, As I have been so unhappy in my unions, I am resolved to continue in future unmarried, and if I should not, I give you leave to stab me. He was, however, unable to persist in this resolution, for he began immediately to think of another wife, and even of taking back Petina, whom he had formerly divorced. He thought also of Lolia Paulia, who had been married to Caius Caesar, but being ensnared by the arts of Agrippina, the daughter of his brother Germanicus, who took advantage of the kisses and endearments 
which their near relationship admitted to inflame his desires, he got someone to propose at the next meeting of the Senate that they should oblige the emperor to marry Agrippina, as a measure highly conducive to the public interest, and that in future liberty should be given for such marriages, which until that time had been considered incestuous. In less than twenty-four hours after this, he married her. No person was found, however, to follow the example, excepting one freedman, and a centurion of the first rank, at the solemnization of whose nuptials both he and Agrippina attended. He had children by three of his wives, by Urgulanilla, Drusus, and Claudia, by Petina, Antonia, and by Messalinia, Octavia, and also a son, whom at first he called Germanicus, but afterwards Britannicus. He lost Drusus at Pompey when he was very young, he being choked with a pear, which in his play he tossed into the air and caught in his mouth, and a few days before he had betrothed him to one of Sejanus's daughters, and I am therefore surprised that some authors should say he lost his life by treachery of Sejanus. Claudia, who was in truth the daughter of Bota, his freed man, though she was born five months before his divorce, he ordered to be thrown naked at her mother's door. He married Antonia to Snaeus Pompey the Great, and afterwards to Fastus Scylla, both youths of very noble parentage, Octavia to his stepson Nero, and after she had been contracted to Slanus. Britannicus was born upon the twelfth day of his reign, and in his second consulship. He often earnestly commended him to the soldiers, holding him in his arms before their ranks, and would likewise show him to the people in the theatre, setting him upon his lap, or holding him out whilst he was still very young, and was sure to receive their acclamations and good wishes on his behalf. Of his sons-in-law, he adopted Nero. He not only dismissed from his favour both Pompey and Solanus, but put them to death. End of Claudius, Part 2 Recording by Alan Steely, Bristol, UK Claudius, Part 3 of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Steely. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Claudius Part 3, Paragraphs 28 to 46. Amongst his freed men, the greatest favourite was the eunuch Poseides, whom, in his British triumph, he presented with the pointless spear, classing him among the military men. Next to him, if not equal in favour, was Felix, whom he not only preferred to commands both the cohorts and troops, but to government of the provenance of Judea, and he became, in consequence of his elevation, the husband of three queens. Another favourite was Harpocrus, to whom he granted the privilege of being carried in a litter within the city, and of holding public spectacles for the entertainment of people. In this class he was likewise Polybius, who assisted him in his studies, and had often the honour of walking between the two consuls, but above all others Narcissus, his secretary, and Pallius, the controller of his accounts, were in high favour with him. He not only allowed them to receive, by decree of the Senate, immense presents, but also to be decorated with the Questorian and Praetorian ensigns of honour. So much did he indulge them in amassing wealth and, and plundering the public, that upon his complaining once at the lowness of his exchequer, someone said, with great reason, it would be full enough if those two freed men of his would take him into partnership with them. Being entirely governed by these freed men, and as I have already said, by his wives, he was a tool of others rather than a prince. He distributed offices, or the command of armies, pardoned or punished, according as it suited their interests, their passions, or their caprice, and for the most part without knowing or being sensible of what he did. Not to enter into the minute details relative to the revocation of grants, the reversal of judicial decisions, obtaining his signature to fictitious appointments, 
or the bare-faced alteration of them after his signing, he put to death Appius Silanus, the father of his son-in-law, and the two Julias, the daughters of Drusus and Germanicus, without any positive proof of their crimes, with which they were charged, or so much as permitting them to make any defence. He also cut off Sneas Pompey, the husband of his eldest daughter, and Lucius Silanus, who was betrothed to the younger Pompey, was stabbed in the act of unnatural lewdness with a favourite paramour. Silanus was obliged to quit the office of Praetor upon the 4th of the Calends of January, and to kill himself on the news day following, the very same on which Claudius and Agrippina were married. He condemned to death five and thirty senators, and above three hundred Roman knights, with so little attention to what he did, that when a centurion brought him word of the execution of a man of consular rank, who was one of a number, and told him that he had executed his order, he declared, he had ordered no such thing, but he had approved of it, because his freed men, it seems, had said that the soldiers did nothing more than their duty in dispatching the emperor's enemies without waiting for a warrant. But it is beyond all belief that he himself, at the marriage of Messalina, with the adulteress Salinus, would actually sign the writings relative to her dowry, induced as it is pretended by the design of diverting from himself and transferring upon another the danger which some omens seemed to threaten him. Either standing or sitting, but especially where he lay asleep, he had a majestic and graceful appearance, for he was tall but not slender. His grey looks became him well, and he had a full neck, but his knees were feeble and failed him in walking, so that his gait was ungainly, both when he assumed state and when he was taking diversion. He was outrageous with his laughter, and still more so in his wrath, for then he foamed at the mouth and discharged from his nostrils. He also stammered in his speech, and had tremulous motion of the head at all times, but particularly when he was engaged in any business, however trifling. Although his health was very infirm during the former part of his life, yet after he became emperor he enjoyed a good state of health, except only that he was subject to a pain in the stomach. In a fit of this complaint he said that he had thoughts of killing himself. He gave entertainments as frequently as they were splendid, and generally when there was such ample room that very often six hundred guests sat down together. At a feast he gave on the banks of the canal for draining the Fusian lake, he narrowly escaped being drowned, the water at its discharge rushing out with such violence that it overflowed the conduit. At supper he had always his own children, with those of several of the nobility, who, according to an ancient custom, sat at the feet of the couches. One of his guests, having been suspected of purloining a golden cup, he invited him again the next day, but served him with a porcelain jug. It is said, too, that he intended to publish an edict, allowing all people the liberty of giving vent at the table to any distension occasioned by flatulence, upon hearing of a person whose modesty, when under restraint, had nearly cost him his life. He was always ready to eat and drink at any time or in any place. One day, as he was hearing causes in the form of Augustus, he smelt the dinner which was preparing for the Salai in the temple of Mars adjoining, whereupon he quitted the tribunal and went to partake of the feast with the priests. He scarcely ever left the table until he had thoroughly crammed himself and drank to intoxication, and then he would immediately fall asleep, lying upon his back with his mouth open. While in this condition, a feather was put down his throat to make him throw up the contents of his stomach. Upon composing himself to rest, his sleep was short, and he usually woke around midnight, but he would sometimes sleep in the daytime, and that even when he was upon the tribunal, so that advocates often found it difficult to wake him, though they raised their voices for that purpose. He set no bounds on his libidious intercourse with women. He never betrayed any unnatural desires for the other sex. He was fond of gaming, and published a book upon the subject. He even used to play as he rode in his chariot, having the table so fitted that the game was not disturbed by the motion of the carriage. His cruel and sanguine disposition was exhibited upon great as well as trifling occasions. When any person was to be put to torture, or criminal punished for parricide, he was impatient for the execution, and would have it performed in his own presence. When he was at Tiber, being desirous of seeing an example of the old way of putting malefactors to death, 
Some were immediately bound to the stake for the purpose. But there being no executioner to be had at the place, he sent for one from Rome and waited for his coming until night. In any exhibition of gladiators presented either by himself or others, if any of the combatants chanced to fall, he ordered them to be butchered, especially the retiari, that he might see their faces in the agonies of death. Two gladiators happening to kill each other, he immediately ordered some little knives to be made of their swords for his own use. He took great pleasure in seeing men engage with wild beasts and the combatants who appeared on the stage at noon. He would therefore come to the theatre by break of day, and at noon, dismissing the people to dinner, continued sitting himself, and besides those who were devoted to the sanguinary fate, he would match others with beasts upon sight or such occasions as, for instance, the carpenters and their assistants, and the people of that sort, if a machine or any piece of work in which they had been employed about the theatre did not answer the purpose for which it was intended. To this desperate kind of encounter he forced one of his nomenclators, even encumbered as he was by wearing the toga. But the characteristics most prominent in him were fear and distrust. In the beginning of his reign, although he much affected a modest and humble appearance, as has been already observed, yet he durst not venture himself at an entertainment without being attended by a guard or spearsman, and made soldiers wait upon him at the table instead of servants. He never visited a sick person until the chamber had been first searched and the bed and bedding thoroughly examined. At other times all persons who came to pay their court to him were strictly searched by officers appointed for that purpose, nor was it until a long time and with much difficulty was he prevailed upon to excuse women, boys and girls from such rude handling, or suffer their attendants or writing masters to retain their cases for pens and styles. When Camillus formed his plot against him, not doubting but his timidity might be worked upon without a war, he wrote to him a scurrilous, petulant, and threatening letter desiring him to resign the government and betake himself to a life of privacy. Upon receiving this requisition he had some thoughts of complying with it, and summoned together the principal men of the city to consult them on the subject. Having heard some loose reports of conspiracies formed against him, he was so much alarmed that he thought of immediately abdicating the government, and when, as I have before related, a man armed with a dagger was discovered near him while he was sacrificing, he instantly ordered the heralds to convoke the senate, and with tears and dismal exclamations lamented that such was his condition, that he was safe nowhere, and for a long time afterwards he abstained from appearing in public. He smothered his ardent love, for Messalina, not so much on the account of her infamous conduct, as from the apprehension of danger, believing that she was aspired to share with Salinas, her partner in adultery, the imperial dignity. Upon this occasion he ran in a great fright, and a very shameful manner, to the camp, asking all the way he went, if the empire were indeed safely his. No suspicion was too trifling, no person on whom it rested too contemptible to throw him into a panic and induce him to take precautions for his safety, and meditate revenge. A man engaged in litigation before his tribunal, having saluted him, drew him aside, and told him he had dreamt that he saw him murdered, and shortly afterwards, when his adversary came to deliver his plea to the emperor, the plaintiff pretended to have discovered the murderer, pointed to him as the man he had seen in his dream, whereupon, as if he had been taken in the act, he was hurried away to execution, we are informed that Appius Salinus was got rid of in the same manner by the contrivance betwixt Messalina and Narcissus, in which they had their several parts assigned to them. Narcissus therefore burst into his lord's chamber before the daylight, apparently in great fright, and told him that he had dreamt that Appius Salinus had murdered him. The empress, upon this affecting great surprise, declared that she had the like dream for several nights successively. Presently afterwards, word was brought, as it had been agreed on, that Appius was come, he having indeed received orders the preceding day to be there at that time, and as if the truth of the dream was sufficiently confirmed by his appearance at that juncture, he was immediately ordered to be prosecuted and put to death. The day following, Claudius related the whole affair to the Senate, and acknowledged his great obligation to his freed men for watching over him, even in his sleep. Sensible of his being subject to passions and resentment, he excused himself in both instances by the proclamation assuring the public that, 
The former should be short and harmless, the latter never without good cause. After severely reprimanding the people of Ostia for not sending some boats to meet him upon his entering the mouth of the Tiber, in terms which might expose them to public resentment, he wrote to Rome that he had been treated as a private person, yet immediately afterwards he pardoned them, and that in a way which had appearance of making them satisfaction, or begging pardon, for some injury he had done them. Some people who addressed him unseasonably in public he pushed away with his own hand. He likewise banished a person who had been secretary to a quaestor, and even a senator who had filled the office of praetor, without hearing. And although they were innocent, the former only because he had treated him with rudeness while he was in a private station, the other because in his adulship he had fined some tenants of his for selling cooked victuals contrary to the law, and ordered his steward, who interfered, to be whipped. On this account, likewise, he took from the Adais the jurisdiction they had over Cook's shops. He did not scruple to speak of his own absurdities, and declared in some short speeches which he published that he had only feigned imbecility in the reign of Caius, because otherwise it would have been impossible for him to have escaped and arrived at the station he had then attained. He could not, however, gain credit for this assertion for a short time afterwards, a book was published under the title of Moron Anastasis, The Resurrection of Fools, the design of which was to show that nobody ever counterfeited folly. Amongst other things, people admired in him his indifference and unconcern, or to express it in Greek, his meteoria and apopepsia. Placing him at a table a little after Messalina's death, he inquired why the empress did not come, Many of those whom he had condemned to death he ordered the day after to be invited to his table, and to game with him, and sent to reprimand them as sluggish fellows for not making greater haste. When he was meditating his incestuous marriage with Agrippina, he was perpetually calling her, My daughter, my nursling, born and brought up upon my lap. And when he was going to adopt Nero, as if there was little cause for censure in his adopting a son-in-law, when he had a son of his own arrived at the years of maturity, he continually gave out in public that no one had ever been admitted by adoption into the Claudian family. He frequently appeared so careless in what he said, and so inattentive to circumstances, that it was believed he never reflected who he himself was, or amongst whom, or at what time, or in what place he spoke. In a debate in Senate, relative to the butchers and vintners, he cried out, I ask you, who can live without a bit of meat? and mentioned the great plenty of the old taverns from which he himself used formerly to have his wine. Among other reasons for his supporting a certain person who was candidate for the questorship, he gave this. His father once gave me, very seasonably, a draught of cold water when I was sick. Upon his bringing a woman as a witness in some cause before the Senate, he said, This woman was my mother's freed woman and dresser, but she always considered me as her master, and this I say because there are some still in my family that do not look upon me as such. The people of Ostia addressing him in open court with a petition, he flew into a rage at them and said, There is no reason why I should oblige you. If any one else is free to act as he pleases, surely I am. The following expression he had in his mouth every day, and at all hours and seasons, What, you take me for a theologus? And in Greek, Speak, but do not touch me besides many other familiar sentences, below the dignity of a private person, much more of an emperor, who was not deficient either in eloquence or learning, as having applied himself very closely to the liberal sciences. By the encouragement of Titus Livius, and with the assistance of Sulpicus Flavus, he attempted at an early age the composition of a history, and having called together a numerous adultery to hear and give their judgment upon it, he read it over with such difficulty, and frequently interrupting himself, for after he had begun a great laugh was raised among the company, by the breaking of several benches from the weight of very fat men, and even when order was restored he could not forbear bursting out into violent fits of laughter at the remembrance of the accident. After he became emperor, likewise, he wrote several things which he was careful to have recited to his friends by a reader. He commenced his history from the death of the dictator Caesar, but afterwards he took a later period and began at the conclusion of the civil wars, because he found he could not speak with freedom and due regard to truth concerning the former period, having been often taken to task both by his mother and grandmother. Of the earlier history he left only two books, but of the latter one and forty. 
He compiled likewise the history of his own life in eight books, full of absurdities, but in no bad style. Also a defence of Ciro against the books of Asinius Gallus, which exhibited a considerable degree of learning. He besides invented three new letters and added them to the former alphabet as highly necessary. He published a book to recommend them while he was yet only a private person, but on his elevation to imperial power he had little difficulty in introducing them into common use, and these letters are still extant in a variety of books, registers, and inscriptions upon buildings. He applied himself with no less attention to the study of Grecian literature, asserting upon all occasions his love of that language, and its surpassed excellency. A stranger once holding a discourse, both in Greek and Latin, he addressed him thus, Since you are skilled in both our tongues, and recommended Achaia to the favour of the Senate, he said, I have a particular attachment to that province on account of our common studies. In the Senate he often made long replies to ambassadors in that language. On the tribunal he frequently quoted the verses of Homer. When at any time he had taken vengeance on an enemy or a conspirator, he scarcely ever gave to the tribunal on guard, who, according to the custom, came for the word any other than this, Andra epinasti ot tis proturus shalpani, tis time to strike when wrong demands the blow. To conclude, he wrote some histories likewise in Greek, namely twenty books on Tuscan affairs and eight on the Carthaginian in consequence of which another museum was founded at Alexandria, in addition to the old one, and called after his name, and it was ordered that upon certain days in every year his Tuscan history should be read over in one of these, and his Carthaginian in another, as in a school, each history being read through by persons who took it in turn. Towards the close of his life he gave some manifest indications that he repented of his marriage with Agrippina, and his adoption of Nero. For some of his freed men, noticing with approbation his having condemned the day before a woman accused of adultery, he remarked, It has been my misfortune to have wives who have been unfaithful to my bed, but they did not escape punishment. Often, when he happened to meet Britannicus, he would embrace him tenderly and express a desire that he might grow apace, and receive from him an account of all his actions using the Greek phrase, Otrosus kai hyasetai, he who was wounded would also heal, and intending to give him the manly habit while he was yet under age and tender youth, because his stature would allow it, he added, I do so, and the Roman people may at last have a real Caesar. Soon afterwards he made his will, and had it signed by all the magistrates as witnesses, but he was prevented from proceeding further by Agrippina, accused by her own guilty conscience, as well as by informers of a variety of crimes. It was agreed that he was taken off by poison, but where and by whom administered remains in uncertainty. Some authors also say that it was given him as he was feasting with the priests in the capital by the eunuch Halotus, his taster, others said by Agrippina, at his own table in mushrooms, a dish of which he was very fond, the accounts of what followed likewise differ. Some relate that he instantly became speechless, was racked with pain through the night, and died about daybreak. Others, that at first he fell into a sound sleep, and afterwards, his food rising, he threw up the hole, but had another dose given him, whether in water gruel, under pretense of refreshment, after his exhaustion, or in a cloister, as if designed to relieve his bowels, is likewise uncertain. His death was kept secret until everything was settled relative to his successor. Accordingly, vows were made for his recovery, and the comedians were called to amuse him, as it was pretended by his own desire. He died upon the 3rd of the Ides of October, 13th of October, in the consulship of Icinius Marcellus and Achilles Aviola, in the 64th year of his age and the 14th of his reign. His funeral was celebrated with the customary imperial pomp, and he was ranked amongst the guards. His honour was taken from him by Nero, but restored by Vespasian. The chief passages of his death were the appearance of a comet, his father Drusus's monument being struck by lightning, and the death of most of the magistrates of all ranks that year. It appears from several circumstances that he was sensible of his approaching dissolution, and made no secret of it. 
for when he nominated the consuls, he appointed no one to fill the office beyond the month in which he had died. At the last assembly of the Senate in which he had made his appearance, he earnestly exhorted his two sons to unity with each other, and with earnest entreaties commanded to the fathers the care of their tender years, and in the last cause that he heard from the tribunal he repeatedly declared in open court that he was now arrived at the last stage of mortal existence, while all who heard it shrunk at hearing these ominous words. End of Claudius Recording by Alan Steely, Bristol, UK